you. We're gonna, looking at the weather map, it looks like I might miss two more votes. If I <laughs> uh, look, at, you know, in Congress, in the House of Representatives, I've sort of modeled my career after Senator Paul's. He's the guy that makes 99 other senators go on the record. And a lot of times, I have run to the floor out of breath to demand a recorded vote in the House of Representatives so that you folks in Iowa can know where your congressman stands. Now this has earned me a reputation and everybody tries to label me and I'm sure they try to give you all labels. They call me uh, an extremist or a Tea Party conservative or constitutional conservative or sometimes they give me the dirty word, call me a libertarian. <laughs> the, the one label they have for me in Washington DC that I like the most is that darn guy who was part of all three coups to get rid of John Boehner. <laughs> I can see that liberty and freedom is strong here in Iowa. In fact, you've got one of the best liberty congressmen in Washington, D.C., Rod Blum. Thank you for sending him to Washington, D.C. You know, there's 247 Republicans and 188 Democrats in the House of Representatives. So that means some of us have to sit on the left side of the aisle. Well, Rod Blum and I love going over on Nancy Pelosi's side and taking their seats to show them that we're in the majority. Well, sometimes they have to walk around us. And so Steny Hoyer, who is the minority whip when Nancy Pelosi retires, and I hope that's tomorrow, but <laughs> when she retires, Steny Hoyer is going to take her place. Well, he was trying to get through the aisle, or, you know, around the row, he's trying to get around me and Rod Blum. And we weren't yielding to the gentleman, Steny Hoyer. And so he says, make some room here, boys. And he looked down, and he saw we were Republican, and he said, I'm going to have to start charging you all rent if you keep coming over here. <laughs> As, and Rod Blum looked at him and said, well, at least we're in the low rent district. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have got a great congressman in Rod Blum. Uh, you might be asking yourself, why in the heck did a congressman from Kentucky drive 14 hours last night to come to Iowa? Well, number one, you guys matter more than anybody in the United States in this presidential election. We're jealous in Kentucky, and you kicked us off. The reason I came 14 hours in a car, and probably going to be in a snowstorm here later with you this week, is because it's the same reason I ran for Congress. I'm worried about our country. I mean, I look at Washington, D.C., they're arrogant, they're not listening, and nothing is changing. And that's the same reason I came to Iowa, to try and save our country. Now you might be asking, well, Congressman Massey, didn't you look at the polls before you got in the car? Like, why did you come to Iowa to campaign for Rand? Didn't you look at the polls? Well, let me tell you what, there were some polls three months ago in Kentucky. We had a governor's race, and it showed that the Democrat was going to shellac the Republican. By the way, we had a Tea Party candidate, and that was the word. That, oh, this guy's too conservative for Kentucky, and the Democrat's going to beat him. Well, guess what? Instead of losing by four points, which is what the polls showed, our Tea Party governor won by nine points. They were off by 14 points, or 13 points. So that's a big deal, and no, the polls don't matter. What matters is which of you go to the caucus and which of you vote. And I know there are folks here that are RAND fans already, and I know there are folks here that are undecided, and that's fair enough, because all the candidates are trying to be the same person right now. They're all trying to convince you they're, they're conservative <coughs> uh, and that they stand for the same things that you do. Well, you don't, have to take, you don't have to take their word for it. Look at their record. Speaking of records, to be on a record, you have to have voted for something. In the House of Representatives, I brought my voting card to show you how we vote in the House. You know, in the Senate, they just call their names off. They go, Akaka, Amber Crombie. They go down the list because the senators <laughs> like to hear their names called off. Well, there's 435 of us, so they make us use cards and we never get to hear our name called. They call me names, but. <laughs> so we put this card in the machine, and there's like 30 or 40 of these machines on the floor, and it works like a, a credit card, actually. It's got a magnetic strip, and you press a button, yay or nay, because the Constitution says that you register the yays and nays. So that's the labels they put on there. But the buttons are red and green, so if you can't read, you know, stop and go. And I'm usually pushing the stop button, because they should be labeled spend and don't spend, those buttons should be. And the problem is there's too many people pushing the spin button. Well, one day I accidentally pulled this out from my wallet. I thought it was my credit card, and I gave it to a waitress to pay for my meal. And I watched her go over. It was kind of dark. I didn't realize she didn't have a real credit card. She was swiping my voting card through the machine. And it, and it wouldn't pay for my meal. She came over and said my card had been rejected. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be washing dishes. And I said, why, why was it rejected? And she showed it to me. It's got the seal of Congress on here. She said, sir, that card already has $18 trillion on it. <laughs> 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 
My kids got a real kick out of that. Because <laughs> um, they're big cynics. Look, does, does anybody here want to defund Planned Parenthood? Does anybody here want to tell the EPA and the FDA to get the hell off our farm? Does anybody here want to tell the Department of Education to take your Common Core and take it back to Washington, D.C.? Frustrating to me, all that, we funded all that stuff this year, but we're in the majority. The Republicans are in the majority in the House and in the Senate. Now, how is it that that happened? That we're in the majority yet we funded all that? You'll hear you'll hear some of these presidential candidates, and you'll hear some people say, "Oh, well, it takes 60 votes in the Senate to really change anything." Well, if it takes 60 votes in the Senate to change anything, why are you running for president? Because guess what? You're not going to have 60 Republicans in the Senate even when you're president. The reality is it, it doesn't take 60. It takes 60 votes, because of the filibuster rule, to fund the EPA, to fund the Department of Education, to fund Planned Parenthood. All that money runs out every year, and you have to vote again to fund it. It takes 60 votes to fund it. All you need are 40 Republicans to stand against it. That's how the math works, but they're trying to tell you it works differently. There's only one candidate on the stage in the debates last night that is telling you the dirty little secret in Washington, D.C., that Republicans in leadership go behind closed doors and they negotiate with the Democrats. And Republicans, as long as they can pay for, the, certain Republicans, as long as the Democrats will agree to pay for expanding our empire and getting into more wars and funding more intervention and funneling weapons to the friends of our enemies, as long as Democrats will agree to that, Republicans agree to fund Planned Parenthood. They agree to fund the waters of the U.S. from the EPA. They agree to fund all of those things. That's the dirty little secret, and that's what Rand has been blowing the whistle on, which is what gives me the confidence that when he gets to Washington, D.C., he is going or into the White House. We can defund those things, but somebody's got to talk about the dirty little secret, and he's the only one that is. The last thing I want to say is, what kind of disposition does it take to be president? Do we want a president that calls people fat and ugly when they don't agree with him? <laughs> that is not going to work, folks. Not on the world stage. It will not work. It might work on a reality show. <laughs> Do we want somebody who fails to read the bill, like the TPA bill, takes a bad position, gets his phone lines melted by his constituents, and then goes to figuring out, trying to figure out a way to get out of this because he didn't read the bill and he made a bad decision. He goes on the floor of the Senate and calls one of his colleagues a liar. Look, you need to take personal responsibility when you take a bad decision or you don't read a bill and consider its ramifications. What you need, what we need, the disposition we need, is the disposition of an eye doctor. Somebody who will look you in the eye and say, I've got good news and bad news. An eye doctor who might say, you know what, the bad news is in five to 10 years, you'll be blind. That's the bad news. The good news is, I can fix this if you'll listen to me. To say it calmly, like Rand does. Folks, what we need in 2016 for a president is an eye doctor, Senator Rand Paul. Yeah.